intelligence and national security and public policy officials. I'd like to start this meeting by having just having them introduce themselves a little bit and talk about their background and why this area is so important to them, starting with our senior senator, Mark Warner. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I'm Mark Warner. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm uh, not really an intelligence professional, but I you know, can be one since I stayed at a holiday in last night. I'm here because I'm the vice chairman of the Southern Intelligence. I'm Brian McKeown. I used to work at the Pentagon as a principal deputy undersecretary of Federal Policy on the National Security Council staff. And I spent 20 years on a number of bill working for Joe Biden, all of which was on staff of foreign relations media since 30 years at the National Security Council. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Matt Olson. I uh, served as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center in McLean uh, during the Obama administration in 2014. Uh, I, before that, I was uh, general counsel for national security at NSCE, and I spent about 20 years at the Department of Justice as a federal prosecutor and as a national security officer. Hi, my name is Tom Cariello. I'm a former congressman. Uh, I was also worked as a peace negotiator and on transitional justice uh, efforts in uh, half a dozen countries, but served in the State Department um, in running the second quadrennial diplomacy and development review, which covered a lot of the uh, national security professionals across North Virginia in terms of the internal impacts and a special envoy to the African Great Lakes. Good morning, I'm Laura Westberger. Um, I served for over a decade at Roger Dean Hofstetler. I am neither an expert on national security or winning elections, but uh, <laughs> a Marine veteran of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And, uh, good morning, thank you. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about something called Mission First, our project to organize the best military families here in Virginia. Wow. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Senator Warner. Senator Warner, the, the district I'm running to represent, the 10th Congressional District, is home to many servicemen and women. Uh, who serve on active duty as well as veterans, uh, federal defense contractors, law enforcement, intelligence community professionals, as well as as well as uh, the home of being the home of the headquarters of the CIA at Langley. Uh, how are Trump's consistent attacks on national security uh, apparatus for this country affecting morale among these groups? And uh, and what what have you observed in terms of, of how they're First of all, Jennifer, uh, thank you for holding this forum for bringing your attention to this uh, critical information. Uh, uh, I don't think we've done a full mapping yet, but I would wager on any level that you have the highest concentration of intelligence professionals to protect them for any district uh, in the country. And I'm going to be doing a town hall at uh, one of our three-letter agencies, non-CIA three-letter agencies, it happens to be seven or eight minutes from here. You can figure out from there. <laughs> um, you know, after the fact. And I, and I think that the issue you raise is, is terribly important. Uh, intelligence professionals are not Republicans or Democrats. Uh, they are Americans first and foremost. Uh, they labor many times in very dangerous situations on a regular basis. And, and candidly don't get the thanks or the recognition um, that we grant to our uniformed military services. And being that voice, and I, as I know you will, in Congress uh, for the intelligence professionals uh, is something that's, that's absolutely important. And they have been under assault. Uh, I go back to thinking about the reports from folks at the agency those first days in the Trump administration where the president stood in front of the wall where the CIA had honored their calling 
and kindly make no reference to those who served at the end of the ultimate sacrifice. Instead, uh, gave the uh, kind of talk that I'm interested in to be able to talk that focuses on himself and, and not on the intelligent professionals. We continue to see you know, Trump say he believes he believes he's smarter than his intelligence professional. Just in the last week, he's also said he was smarter than his when he was uh, indirectly criticizing Secretary of Defense of Madison, saying he knows more than Secretary Madison. No, Donald Trump does not know more than the intelligence professionals or military generals. Any responsible leader has to be willing to take the advice and counsel. They can draw their own conclusions, but they have to take the, the advice and counsel first before they can do the job. Right? And um, nothing is, is more important uh, for intelligence professionals than to be able to speak truth to power. And if there's one thing that's clear out of this White House is uh, they don't want to hear truth. They want to hear simply folks that will uh, repeat whatever happens to be the line out of the White House that day. So I think the morale, one of the things that I've tried to do is uh, go to the agencies on a regular basis, say that there are many of us in Canada, many of us in both parties, I'm very proud of the way the Senate Intelligence Committee has conducted its investigation into the Russian interference. Um, and we have to continue to try to conduct that in a bipartisan way. I and mean, we may get to other questions on this later. That's not the way the House has uh, conducted itself. And the last point on, on this issue is when you get to the House, uh, I hope you'll have a chance uh, to serve on the Intelligence Committee, uh, not to at least stay involved, <coughs> because I worry, and I say this, I'm proud of the fact that on a per capita basis, Virginia has the highest concentration of military installations. We build our country's aircraft carriers and submarines. But I wonder sometimes, in a nation where we just passed a budget, where we spent $716 billion on defense. I worry at times that we may be buying the world's best 20th century military uh, in terms of tanks and trucks and, and airplanes when much of the 21st century conflict is going to be, be in the realm of cybersecurity and misinformation and disinformation. And our near peer adversaries like Russia and China uh, are our peers, unfortunately, in those domains, and uh, how we have members of Congress that under understand that shift in our national security paradigm is going to be critically important. Why I, for one, I think uh, somebody here want to make sure uh, for the next 18 days uh, you get hired for this job mm -hmm. and uh, can join those of us who will be there supporting our team. seen as falling apart at the seams, then that has huge ramifications around the world. 
I think one of the things that is so important right now is not just the experience people bring to Congress, um, but what they're willing to learn and work hard on uh, while they're there. And so, Jennifer, your point, I think one of the things that I emphasized over and over again when I was a diplomat doing negotiations overseas was that Congress holds the first strings. Congress actually exerts an enormous amount of influence on foreign policy, whether it's on oversight, whether it's on spending. We had very important individual targeted sanctions on some of the leaders in the Democratic Republic of Congo that had an enormous impact on reducing the levels of repressive violence in that country. That was a bipartisan effort from the Hill, both House and Senate, um, of a coalition that has stood by those values. And those are the sorts of things that we've seen Jennifer be able to build in Richmond, bipartisan coalitions to get things done. Um, and Congress really does have a huge role to play. I want to mention one other thing about Congress's role on a place that Senator Wexton has had such an impact. When we did the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, we found one of the challenges we have is being able to retain our national security personnel in Northern Virginia because of issues of cost of living and transportation. You may not think of that as a national security issue, but it is. Our ability to ensure a solid, economically secure lifestyle for families who want to locate here, because of the quality of our schools, uh, looking at transportation issues, these things matter. And when you think about national security, it's not just the uh, weapons we build and the um, you know, uh, tankers we build, though those things can be very certainly important. It's also about whether we are treating our national security personnel uh, with the opportunities they need to have an economically secure future. Those are things Senator Waxman fought for in Richmond, and we know she's going to fight for them uh, up in D.C. So when we think about Congress's role in national security, it has an enormous role to play on the values we project, on where we invest, uh, as Senator said, not just in last century's threats, but next century's threats. And people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the homework, and that's something we've seen over and over from Senator Waxman, and I know we'll see it from Congressman. This, and I do think it's a it's a critical reason why we need uh, we need to have a change in, in your candidacy, candidacy, Jennifer, um, because I think it will start holding the, the White House accountable uh, 
uh, particularly in the House and, and what we can see in terms of oversight from uh, the Intelligence Committee or the Judiciary Committee. And I think that will start to make a change and start to send the right message to uh, the women and men in the Intelligence Committee that their voice does matter. And when they speak truth to power, there are people who are listening. Can I just add something? That one that did a great, great job. Yeah. A spectacular job. But one item, and echoing what Tom has said, that we need to still make progress on, we're starting to, uh, but that is the backlog in security clearances. Yeah. You know, we, we have gotten to the point where we had a 740,000 person security clearance backlog. That's crazy. You want to be a young person joining the CIA. Average time to get your clearance was 535 days. For young men and women who want to, who want to yeah. take the do mission are getting held off because of security clearances. Um, we, we still have retired FBI agents going out and checking people's college transcripts rather than doing it online or checking uh, uh, somebody's criminal records. So there are smart, smart ways we're starting to bring this down. Doesn't fall on a Democratic or Republican basis, but you know, not only for folks who serve directly, but you will have in your district lots of folks who are um, contractors. And we see examples where somebody may, may be working in one part of DHS and they're transferred to another project inside DHS, and it will take them over 100 days to get their clearance transferred over. So, uh, to the question of uh, not only quality of life that we offer folks here in Northern Virginia, but their ability to do their jobs. Uh, this is an area that needs, a, needs attention. Of course, we, we're down, we brought it down about 80,000, uh, the backlog. Uh, we do have some commitments, but we need other people to work on the issue of resources or, or it, it's, it's an issue of our it's, it's an issue of some resources where this ends up being GNA overhead and gets pushed off to the end of the year needs to be a higher priority. It frankly also uh, needs to, we just, when we've got intelligence professionals, I think we need to move away from the periodic reexamination to what's called continuous evaluation. Uh, we've got a lot of tools that we can use with, with folks to continually monitor uh, in, in ways that are, you know, keep us safer, that won't be as, as disruptive. And there are simple things like being able to look at transcripts uh, on a remote, uh, remote basis using technology. Companies do that. Having that interoperability in between different security agencies so that you get a clearance in one agency, uh, you may be able to get a clearance in another as long as you meet minimum standards. Uh, there are just common sense business practices. Uh, there are some folks in the community that have started to understand but it really, not only are we not getting our best people because they don't want to wait, but frankly, we're costing the taxpayer money because we've got people on contracts that can't do their work because they can't do it. I'll just say a couple of things quickly. One, it's not just that the president doesn't believe the intelligence community. He's been attacking the intelligence community and the law enforcement community. And as an American, you really have to think about how dangerous this is for our democracy. These are, Yes, they have political appointees at the top, but these are, by and large, as Matt said, apolitical institutions. And the Justice Department, by design, has a certain degree of independence from the White House, dating back to the Nixon administration. And the President is eroding that, and there are members of the House of Representatives now, and the leadership as the Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, who are supporting this, these attacks. So you really have to stop and think about why that is happening, why more members of Congress and the majority are not speaking up about it. The second thing I would say is the attacks on the federal workforce across the board have a corrosive effect. When I was in the Department of Defense, we had issues because of the furlough and the threats of the government shutdown, budget control act, which had budgets. And whenever we had talented civil servants leave, I would do exit interviews. To a person, they would all say, you know, I just can't take it anymore. The shutdown, the threat to my paycheck, people don't seem to value what we're doing. I, I can go make a lot more money doing something else. I love this job. I, I love working in the department.
Department of Defense and serving my country, but it's just not worth it. And you, you can't discount them as a factor uh, because people sort of lose patience. They're, they're working 12 and 14 hour days and they're getting beaten up by the people who are in charge. And that inevitably, not everyone's going to stick it out and they're going to lose a lot of good people. nominated large numbers of veterans and former national national security professionals to seek positions in Congress and other public offices, including women like Abigail Spanberger here in Virginia and Amy McGrath in Kentucky. R.D., you served in Iraq and Afghanistan and then got involved politically with your group's mission first. Can you, can you tell the group a little bit about uh, what led you to do that and what you're hearing from veterans and service members about this election and what it means to them? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for the question. I want to briefly thank a few people here. The, this would not exist without Jerome Sims' help. Uh, he's a great uh, Virginian and a great veteran. Really happy to have his help. Uh, Tom Barrell and Senator Warner have also been you know, asking me, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? So it's a, it's a team effort. Um, you may know the name Dante Tanner. He ran for House of Delegates. And he's an Air Force veteran. And he lost by 106 votes. And that really stuck with me. And I kept thinking, we couldn't find 106 uh, veterans, military families, or allies in that House of Delegates system to make sure he could have been the deciding vote on health care. So elections matter. Those 106 votes stuck with me. And after I was unsuccessful in my own primary, I really wanted to see if there's a way that we could help other candidates, great candidates like Jennifer, here in Virginia. So we started something called Mission First. And what we're doing is organizing vets and military families throughout the Commonwealth. We're going to make sure Jennifer doesn't, make sure she gets those 106 votes. <laughs> <laughs> make sure she gets them. And uh, it's a fantastic organization. We have Naveed here today. He's our organizer in this district. He's an Army veteran himself. He served in Iraq, too. He's doing a great job here in the 10th Defense District. Now, veterans tend to be a little more conservative in general. And I'm going to tell you just briefly about one of them. Uh, Uncle Bill Barton lives down in North Carolina. And he served in Vietnam. He has a Purple Heart. I'm very proud of him. He happens to be a Republican. Calls me about every two weeks and tells me how great the job the president's doing. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm not going to give up on him, though. I'm going to keep talking to him about how we need to have, everybody's got to have health care they can afford, everybody deserves to have skills that they can compete in the economy. Um, and that's really important to me, that we don't just go for Democrats. Let's organize all these vets and military families. And I've had people come up to me and say, Artie, I'm, I'm not a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Can I come too? Yes, you can. The door is open. You're welcome to come and join our Mission First effort because we want to put the country first and make sure these candidates make it across the finish line. I want to say one other thing, Jennifer. The question is, you know, what are you hearing from these veterans? Veterans want to know where their country has gone. Where is the country that freed a continent and saved Western civilization? Where is the country that freed, that liberated concentration camps? Where is that country being the beacon of hope to every end of the earth? That is what they fought for. That is what is important to them. That's what makes them who they are. And that's what this is about. That's what Jennifer's election is about. It's fighting for those values, as Tom mentioned, not just here, but overseas, and making sure we are that beacon of hope all across the world. And that's what we're trying to do and help, uh, help Jennifer with this effort. Thank you. 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 Thank you
that it believed our country had been attacked by Russia <coughs> under specific orders from Vladimir Putin. The president still, to this day, has not acknowledged this consensus. And more alarmingly, he has, in my view, not taken sufficient steps to, to hold Russia accountable or prevent it from happening again. <coughs> he has instead directed repeated attacks against his former FBI director, Robert Mueller, who was assigned to tell the truth. I'm curious to hear the thoughts of the panel about what Congress can and should do about um, you know, to me, from a national security perspective, one of the most disturbing things about what you just said, rightly, is that our country was attacked. Our country was attacked by Vladimir Putin. And instead of coming together to deal with this problem, the president and congressional Republicans have politicized this issue and, and driven us apart. Um, you know, I think, uh, for me, I, uh, I sort of went in the direction of national security um, after 9-11, I was a senior in college on that day. And at that time, we were deciding what comes next. And I woke up on September 12th, and I said, you know, this is what I'm doing with my life. My, do my part to see that this kind of thing never happens uh, to our country again. And I joined the State Department in, um, during the Bush administration because um, though I'm a Democrat, you know, I believe that we come together around national security issues to defend our country. Um, you know, there are places where that is happening. Senator Warner um, and, and Chairman Burr on the Senate Intelligence Committee have been one real beacon of bipartisanship on this issue, but as he mentioned, it's true. It's true. But but as he mentioned, you know, the, the House Intelligence Committee really is is the mere opposite of that, um, where this has become an incredibly politicized issue, and that's the case. Um, across across the House of Representatives, um, and and I think that one of the most important things, um, you know, when Democrats um, take uh, control of, of Congress um, in November, is going to be to be able to to really reach some bipartisan solutions around the set of issues. The, the good news is that in terms of what Congress can do, there's actually numerous pieces of legislation that have already been introduced, many of them with bipartisan support, that are ready to go and would do things like. You know, providing greater cybersecurity for our election systems, that would do things like ensuring that um, we have the same transparency and disclosure on political advertising online that we do offline to make sure that Russia and others can't buy um, can't buy political advertising uh, to influence our elections. Um, you know, the kind of work that's being done with the tech companies that Senator Warner and Chairman Burr have been doing, um, I think, could really be replicated um, on the House side, and it's a real place where we need leadership, as, as Senator Warner rightly said, you know, the 21st century battles that we're going to be facing are not necessarily with just aircraft carriers and missiles. It's going to be an artificial intelligence. It's going to be an information operation. It's combined with cyber tools. These are the kinds of things where we need real minds coming together, focusing on these issues, and, and really working on the challenges um, and, and developing solutions. And, and the other piece of this that I think is really important is, um, and this goes back to, to what our team was saying too about some you know, where, you know, where has our country gone? Where, where does that begin to gone? I spent a lot of time um, working with European allies who are also wrestling with these same challenges of Russia interfering in, the, in their democracies. And, and, you know, they're so used to looking to the United States um, for help, for leadership, for answers. Um, and I think that it's incredibly important. This is a global challenge, um, and we really need that kind of leadership, including from Congress, um, to be able to work with our partners and allies and really make sure that, that we can meet this threat. Because I believe that we can meet this challenge if we have the will to do so. And that is unfortunately what has been lacking to date. chose only to reveal information that would hurt the Democratic candidate. We know they rattled the door and in certain states actually penetrated onto the voter files of over 21 states. We know they used social media in a way that frankly caught the U.S. government and the social media companies off guard in terms of not only supplying and 
buying up political ads, but more importantly, creating a whole series of fake personas to go out and try to disrupt the, the election. And we also know that in almost every one of those areas, they did not stop on November, in November of 2016. They've continued. Matter of fact, there are experts that have pointed out, and probably speak to this as well, is that enormous spike in activity on both sides of the argument around the Judge Kavanaugh hearings of foreign activity. Now, two different kind of points here. One is, and I don't think one of the things that Donald Trump understands, is that the words of an American president matter. In many ways, they may matter more even abroad than they do here at home. So the irony was um, through the Atlantic Foundation, we held a meeting of a number of parliamentarians, bipartisan, I have more people with the countries that had also been had Russian intervention. So we had 20 European countries meeting in Washington. And the irony was that the day we met was the day that uh, Trump did such a pathetic performance with Puma and Helsinki. Mm -hmm. So to see all these countries, they were Estonians and Latvians and Ukrainians and Poles and you know the Brits and the French, all countries where they 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 documented evidence of Russian intervention to see an American president kowtow to a Russian president and accept his explanations. It's just crazy to see this past week has been mentioned as more and more and more and more information will come out about what may end up proving to be just a brutal murder of somebody who had been living in Virginia while maybe not an American citizen, uh, but the president's unwillingness so far to call out the actions of the Saudi activity. So for that matter, stand up for journalists everywhere around the world. That's part as Thomas so artfully said, uh, articulately said, you know, American values are represented by an American president. And when you don't hear commitment to human rights, when you don't hear commitment to a free press, people may take that as a sense that those aren't American values. Well, they are. But an American president needs to stand up for those, and it's not an American congressman. So they, they are, and, and war has done some great, great work in this area. And one of the reasons why we have to continue to be on guard, because if you add up all the money that the Russians spent in appealing in our elections, French presidential elections, in the British Brexit vote, where now there is a bipartisan British parliamentary inquiry. All that together is less than the cost of one U.S. 35 million. So this is both effective and cheap. Um, so Congress does need to step up if the president doesn't do it. The Mueller investigation, which has got five convictions and 30 guilty plea and, and 30 indictments, needs to continue and be finished. Congress and particularly uh, Democrats take the House need to allow that investigation to come to its conclusion. You need to know the 